Great. Thank you so much. Man, that was so good. We should just dismiss now, right? Watch your mouth, young lady. You could have gone to children's church. Though, <laughs> you're complaining. That was great. Thank you so much. Love the energy of that. Um, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word and the opportunity to listen. Encourage me today and challenge me today in your word as we ask for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. The passage is in Hebrews chapter 10. In the early days of television, perfect families were the, really the only thing that were shown. So it's things like Leave It to, the Be- Leave it to Beaver and uh, Dick Van Dyke Show. Then f- slowly they dabbled in a little less than normal but more real-to-life families like the Andy Griffith Show, Eddie's Father, were single parents. Uh, The Brady Bunch was a blended family, and in fact, My Three Sons, it aired forever. It's 380 episodes of that. They morphed a little bit. It was single dad, but then three sons, one left the show, then they adopted one, probably just to keep with the number three, better than changing the name. And then he married and had a stepdaughter in the mix, so it was... It was beginning to look a little bit more like what we're used to, what life really is about. Then all of a sudden, families became a bit dysfunctional, like uh, Al Bundy, for instance. Maybe a family unit became a little bit more unusual, and of course, nobody gets Father of the Year award like our friend Homer Simpson. Families can be a little dysfunctional, but we put up with it, right? I mean, we have to. And whoever the weakest link is, it may not be the same one in a year or two down the way, but there's always somebody who's most drama, but truthfully, we all add to it. So why wouldn't we think the church would be the same way? Well, somehow we've thought that we have our dysfunctional family and we all do, and we come together, and this place needs to be just right. Like, why are we surprised that we have conflict now and then, and disagreement with all the varied backgrounds that we have represented in this room? Well, of course there's going to be some dysfunction along the way. So whether it's here or in your own family, or at school. And I think teams are often a good example because you have a team that they have a central goal and mission, and yet the team's made up of pretty different people. How we all get along and what we do is what this series is about. Last week, which is a reason, we started with bear with each other. It's put up with one another. There are days that internally we just roll our eyes at a teammate. We're like, you just got to get used to it. It's just who they are. It's just what we do. We just, it just, we keep rolling. And your own family is that way too. We just got to keep going. It's just what it is, and we deal with it the way it is. But today is a different challenge. Today is that we are to stir one another, to be stirrers stir one another to love and good deeds. If you have a Bible there with you, it's Hebrews chapter 10. If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, we'll start with verse 24. We'll go back up in just a moment, but look at Hebrews 10, 24. Let us hold fast Uh, That's 23, 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. Let's consider how we're to stir one another up to love and good deeds. So out of the 34 passages in the Bible that speak of one another, this is the only one that mentions this, stir one another. And isn't it interesting that it says, consider how we are to stir one another. 
The command is actually not stir one another, it's consider it. So you have your sports team, it's thinking ahead of time, how can I be one to encourage the team to care, to do good? How do I best do that? Your family and your friends. What's the target? Well, we in the mix, and whether it's a family or work environment, and definitely here, we in the mix are to say, I'm here, and because I'm here, I'm going to have people around me do better. They're going to be better for it. I'm going to be that guy, that gal that says, I'm in the room, and I'm going to do my best to bring the best out of everybody that's around me. The word stir is an unusual one in the Bible. It's only used twice. This is one of them. Consider how you're to spur one another on to love and good deeds. The other one, you don't even see it. It's in Acts 15. It's translated different, but it's the same word. It's when Paul and Barnabas were arguing, heading off onto a mission together. Paul and Barnabas, the little team. Barnabas says, John Mark needs to go with us. And Paul said, there's no way I'm going with him. Here's the passage. It says, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed one from the other. Barnabas left with John Mark. Paul left with Silas. And the contention was so sharp. They were stirred. That was the word. It's the only other place it's used. Stir one another onto love and good deeds. And they were so stirred that they just separated and they went their own ways. I pulled up eight translations of this. Eight translations, and these are the words that are used. This is, it's pretty varied. Stir one another on to love and good deeds. Motivate one another to love and good deeds. Spur. Stimulate on to love and good deeds. Provoke one another to love and good deeds. Promote. Eight translations, six different words. You know, that tells us, linguistically, it tells us there's not an English word that is that word. So they have to take a stab at it. They're doing the best they can. And so in those cases, all of them usually serve as the best example of what that word is. You and I come into a room, and this is true of a meeting of some sort, of a club or organization that you're a part of. It's a party that you go to. It's a classroom or a locker room. It's walking in here on Sunday morning and saying, I am here to promote, motivate, stir, promote people to their best love and good deeds. What a difference. We decide to come here today based on what was best for us. It fit my schedule. So I like Easter. Easter like resets everything because everyone picks Easter to be here. But then within a week, it's all pick and choose again. It's what are my options this morning? It's all based on ourselves. Rather than I have opportunity to be around people who are actually showing a willingness and openness to be promoted and spurred on and stirred and promoted to be a better person. That's why we're here. So when we walk up to somebody we could actually ask ourselves, when I walked away, are they more neutral or less stirred? 
to better themselves? Do I walk away and make more people happy when I walk away (laughs) than when I walked up? Do I drain the life out of people when I talk to them? (laughs) You can hear when you walk up. You're like, no, no. It's like a Star Trek episode. No. (laughs) Life's out of you. And when they leave, when they get away, you have to rebuild. You're like, whew, I'm glad that's over. That was exhausting. Okay, that, by the way, is all of us at different times. So if you're thinking of someone, it's especially you. It's all of us at different times. Or can we be on our game? And it's hard. That's why we need each other. You walk into the locker room, there are some days you don't even want to be there. You're sore from the last game or match. You're not feeling up to this. You're not doing your best. You're out of your grit, and you're just like, oh. Well, that's time for somebody else to step up and say, come on, let's go. Let's go. It's okay. Let's move. It's stirring them, motivating them, promoting them to love and good deeds. And even though we need it, and this is the trick, even though we need it, because there are times in which, as we stir, there are times in which we're the ones that are down, like we barely made it here. Not a very good day to go to church, (laughs) assuming there is such a day. I mean, you just barely make it in, and you're like, okay, I need someone to stir me. This is the day that I need it. Okay, this is, this is, that's when you need to look out and stir somebody. Am I right? When you and I are at our most down place in life, those are the days to not give in to it and say, I need they're not doing enough. They've not helped me enough. They've, they know I'm struggling, and they're not doing anything. No, those are the days in which we say, okay, I'm about at the bottom. You may not even know why. It's, it's a mental state of a place where you are, where you're like, I don't even know why. Things are fine, but I am so down right now. Those are the days to say, okay, I need to get out of myself and focus on somebody. Focus on others. Not with the expectation of anything, but simply to fulfill the command to let us let us stir one another on to love and good deeds. It is now the second point, but it's the same verse. Let us consider how to stir one another to love and good deeds. Do I successfully do that? So Emma moved out of our house two years ago. She got married, and she left in her room that cactus. It was almost creepy. It was almost a a scary movie. It was just a little cactus in a little pot that as soon as it got a little and started to tilt, she scotch-taped it to the window. And I, we didn't know this. She also had a, like that squirrel. Remember the squirrel that she talked to every morning? It was right. It was on the wall, looking at her every morning. And um, and I took care of that. <laughs> I wonder where the squirrel went, Dad. Hmm. I have no idea that I can share. So the so she scotch taped it, and then before long, and it was almost like it grow almost in front of her eyes. I was like you just watch it. It was like, is it in nuclear waste potting soil is, I think, what this thing was. It glowed at night. So she'd tape it and then tape it and then tape it. This thing was all over the window. In fact, you walk in the room, it would usually do that to you. I mean, it was creepy. It was really creepy. But the idea was that she put, like we do with a plant, theoretically, if you like plants, theoretically, if you take care of them, if you nurture, give it what it needed. It happened to need some, is there even a vine-like cactus? I've never even heard of one, except this one. She spent so much time nurturing this thing that it just wouldn't stop. 
yeah, if I could look at people that I come in contact with as somebody to stir on to love and good, that's what we're created for. In fact, the Bible says that we have good works that were created in advance for you to do. This isn't general. This was specific. Good works that were created for you to do. So we come along and brush, and whether it's a believer talking at a grocery store or whether it's in a big meeting here or whether it's a sports, it's come alongside and put the scotch tape on and say, I'm going to help hold you up a little bit. I want you to flourish. I want you to grow more. I want you to be stronger. I want you to be better because of your efforts person that walks up to you, that they walk away somewhat flourished. There's a really old writer. It's a kind of a cheap commentary to get because it was before copyrights. It's Adam Clark. Listen to how he paraphrased this verse. Let us diligently and attentively consider each other's trials, difficulties, and weaknesses. Feel for each other excite each other to an increase to love God and man, and as proof of it, be fruitful in good works. So here's, um, let me apply this uh, with some dating advice. You're not going to admit it, but if you're in this room and you're dating, or you'd like to, here's some advice. When you're going out for a little while, and let's just say it, it's going okay, it's a couple, you're a couple months in, you haven't scared them away yet. Well done, gentlemen, well done. You're eating like with silverware, you're doing everything right at this point. A couple months in, the question that is always really good, very directly to ask is, is my walk with the Lord better because of them or not? Guys, gals need to ask that. Gals really need to ask that. Am I walking with the Lord? Is there a spring in my step in my relationship with God through Jesus? Is it better because of that person in my life or not? And if the answer is or not, if this works out longer, it's worse later because they're in their best behavior now. If in their best behavior, you're not walking closer to the Lord, that's not the person you want to spend your life with. Am I right? And there are many that wish they had that advice a long time ago because it's true. It's a fair question. And as friends that have people that are dating, it's our job to ask that question for them and to observe I see you're just blossoming. You, you've got, seems like your good heart has just showing, and it's because of that person that you're with. Man, they are bringing the best out of you to love in good deeds. Do I successfully motivate or promote or stir others to love and good deeds? Take a look at the rest of the sentence, though. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25, Hebrews 10. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. Get the context. This is a most famous passage, not really for these verses. These verses blossom out of the most famous part of this passage. Look back up a little bit in verse 19 of chapter 10. We've already talked about the fact that Jesus, his sacrifice was full and complete. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we have relationship with God. This is amazing. Verse 19, therefore, because of that, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that's opened up through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let's draw near to God 
because you have faith in Jesus, first think, draw near to God, full assurance of faith, hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, bodies washed with pure water, hold fast to the confession that you made at first, so keep faithful, and let us consider how we are to spur one another on to love and good deeds. And let us not neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. What he did was he tied it to the actual core of who we are. It's not like another command, one of a hundred that he gives. He's actually taking it to the core of it. Since we've been raised with Christ, who's seated at the right hand of God the Father, that curtain and separation of sin has been ripped aside. We have a sacrifice, a new and living way, though, not like an old sacrifice that's dead. We have a new and living way made for us that we can go directly to God. So let's consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. You and I are focused to walk with Christ. You and I want to do the best we can and walk with Jesus. That's why you do your Bible reading and you do a prayer and you add pieces throughout the week and maybe you do Christian radio. We do all these things to walk with Him. And we look around us to say, okay, we need others going with us. Stir one another on to love and good deeds. Oh, but don't neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. This is it. If this is your place of fellowship, this, don't neglect meeting together. It, it misses. It misses the point. The gears are grinding at this point. We're to meet together because together we do this. It's not separate. We meet and not neglect it as some are in the habit of doing. There's a Christian college. I was over a college ministry for a while. Uh, Sarah and I did that. Uh, for s- several years, had a fun group, probably 100 on a, a regular basis, uh, maybe 100, 125 college-age students in a room. And we had a lot of fun with that group. And there was a nearby Christian college. And I'm surprised that I actually did this. I had regretted it, but now I'm proud of it again. So it goes through phases. That I put in every student's box from us in our college ministry I just simply gave, an, gave a statement, and it was this. I said, if you are faithfully in a local church body, you may or may not be in a healthy relationship with God. If you are not in faithfully with a local church body, there are unhealthy issues happening in your life right now. That's all I said. That was it. Love always, Pastor Rob. (laughs) I should have said, love always, okay, I'm kind of a jerk, Pastor Rob. And I had college students ask me about, hey, about that, I said, prove me wrong, prove me wrong. Somebody who goes to church all the time, fellowship, not just go to church, right? The difference? We can walk in and out and have no connection. I'm talking about in fellowship regularly with a body of believers. Some of them can be the worst people in the world, right? Because it's fake. Others are amazing. But you take a believer in Jesus who is regularly and faithfully outside of fellowship, something's wrong. We've never been created that way. We're created for fellowship. That when I'm weak, you're strong. When my dysfunction isn't at its best, yours is. It's just we're working this thing together, and God's Holy Spirit works through the local church. Always has. We've never meant to exist outside of the local church. 
we will say the other part of that all the time. Oh, I don't really pick a church. I go to all churches because God's family and God's church, the universal church, are all believers in the world. Oh, that's true. We don't deny that a bit. There are believers represented about every church in town, some more than others. I don't, depending on the day and the year, who's leading them. The universal church, all believers in the world, one church. Divided where everybody is broken into local fellowships. Too many today. Oh, I don't... I don't go to one, I go to several. You know what that means is I'm not submitting to the leadership of any local shepherd that works under the great shepherd. That's what I'm doing. I'm playing that card, and I will not submit to the leadership of a local body. It's anti-New Testament. It's anti-church. But for us, and it literally is like preaching to the choir, for us, we know that. That's why we come. When we can, I get it. Traveling, there's work. I get it. I get it. But it's more than coming. It's the fellowship. It's the engaging. Where I need you. And you need all of us. Stir one another onto loving good deeds and not neglect to meet together as some are in the habit of doing. So I did, a, uh, I did an internet search of dysfunctional families. None of us showed up. I know, right? I thought for sure Janovich would be like top. I thought surely it's going to be. And it, uh, so good for you guys. You're not top. You're top. I mean, you were in there, but you weren't top. So here are some. Tell me if you know who some of these are. How about the Whites or the Schraders? The Whites? Okay. Breaking Bad. The Lannisters? TV show? Someone say what show that is. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. There you go. We all know Simpsons and Sopranos. How about the Griffins? What show? Oh, you know that one too? <laughs> I'm proud of you. Well done. Well done. He's like, dysfunctional families, bring it. Because it makes our families look normal. Although we admire them a little bit too. The Griffins are pretty funny. Okay, the number one dysfunctional family television show was actually, it's uh, Grant's and my... I, Am I allowed to say this online? I could edit it out later so it won't go online. Casey? Okay? Depending on how this goes, we might have to edit this out. The Bluths. Yes? Yeah, 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 yeah. Give it to me. Well done. Arrest, is that not the funniest show? So here you have, it's Arrested Development. What the lineup of that show. Uh, Liza Minnelli's on that. Ron Howard, Jason Bateman. Um, it's, it's just a lineup of people are ridiculous. And then cameos along the way also. Henry Winkler's on it. He's the funniest role on this show, Rest of Development. So here's the exchange. Uh, Michael is the father. Talking to his son, George Michael, who's 13 years old. And he goes, what have we always said is the most important thing? And George Michael said, breakfast? He goes, no, family. It's family. George Michael responds by saying, oh, I thought we were talking about of things that we eat. No, it's family. Family's the most important thing. That's one of the things with the Bluths on that show is it's all about family, and it is the most dysfunctional family on television are the Bluths. There they are. I don't know. We can give it a run for its money. Family has some similarity that brings them together. We have vast amounts of difference, economic difference, background, socioeconomic. We have so many differences, but we have the greatest similarity. 
It is so important for us to continually rehearse the fact that we're sinners and we have no access to God at all. There was no access. There was nothing we could do in our sin. Rehearse the sin in your life. It's the same as everybody else's. Might be more fun to listen to. Might be more clever than the rest. Might have involved the law. Others, it doesn't involve the law. It's separation from God because of our sin. It all did the same thing. No possibility of access with God until God provided Jesus Christ. He provided Jesus as a sacrifice so that as we stood condemned, Jesus said, I'll take the punishment. He lived a sinless life. He died in our place as a substitute. He rose from the dead, conquering death, conquering sin, which is available through faith only. Will you say amen to that? Is that not the storyline of life? Now we're all the same for all of those who have believed in Jesus Christ, turned from believing what you used to think, which was that you're good enough, to believing that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, faith in Him. There we are. And now we have to navigate life. we got to figure out, how do I live for Him, walking with Jesus and following Him? How do I do that in a world that is exactly opposite? They exist for themselves. You do that on your sports team and at your workplace. They're good people, but they exist for themselves. We don't. We exist for others. We follow the example of Jesus. And in this passage, it's explaining to us that because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are to stir one another on to love and good deeds and not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And that's my prayer for us this week. Whoever you come in contact with, sitting around, walking out, throughout your week, would you consider how is it I could stir them on to love and good deeds and also not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing? Will you pray with me? heads bowed, eyes closed. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can right now. Just between you and Him, you can pray to God right now in the quietness right this minute and you say, Heavenly Father, I need you. I know that I've sinned and I'm separated from you. No matter what I do, I'm separated but thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death, his burial, his resurrection. I trust him only for eternal life. Heavenly Father, for those that just prayed with me, what a wonderful day this is. This is the greatest of days, putting faith and trust in you. I would pray they would grow and help others grow to love and good deeds, that none of us would neglect our meeting together. We'd live our lives in allegiance to you selflessly for those around us. And we'll pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.